Welcome back to Cracklin' Rosie True Crime. While I was reading more letters from David Berkowitz to Dr. Abramson, written from Attica Correctional Facility, I decided to just turn my camera on and read the next one to you. So this letter is dated August 13th, 1979. So two years after the arrest and the arraignment of David Berkowitz. David Abramson, MD, 1035 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10028. Dear Dr. Abramson, this letter is in reference to your letter dated 8979. Also, I had sent to you a large envelope with other writings. Please let me know when you receive it. My mother managed to find out about our communications from my friend, Bernice. Betty Falco carefully weaseled it out of my friend, and this was with regards to your article in the New York Times. As of yet, I haven't heard anything from my lawyer via Klausner. However, my girlfriend did tell me this past Saturday that my mother did call her and managed to pump her for information. Finally, I have noticed a change in my mother's letters, which have become quite impassioned and nonsensical. I love you, Richie. I love you, Richie. I love you, Richie. Over and over again. It's really very silly. I've also written to my lawyer with regards to my property. Miss Johnson did promise me that I could have all the pictures that were originally in my apartment. So I'm gonna stop there for a moment. Something that I'd read, and this was a while back before the data dump, was David fantasized about his real or his biological mom and his dad, or he says he did as a child and he did it often. Um, one of the things that I read in the way I interpreted it was he was a little bit disappointed. He didn't like her voice and he would make fun of it like richie richie so when i read this that's why i changed uh tone a little bit i love you richie i love you richie but i remember reading that that he was very disappointed he thought that his biological mom was going to be glamorous you know he had this whole fantasy thing going on and you know, whether when she just turns out to be a regular mom, I uh, believe he was disappointed, or at least he claims he was. Okay. Also, um, interesting that he mentions that those pictures, the photographs from his apartment were very important. Remember, we talked about that, that most of his pictures were of his dad, Nathan. He did have a few other family pictures. It looked like maybe one from when he was a little boy with mom and uh, mom Pearl and, and Nathan, but the, there were quite a few that were just of his dad. So he was looking to get those pictures. Okay, I will carry on for you. The word suppress is new to me. Yes, I imagine that I've consciously suppress many things as well as unconsciously repress things too. In fact, now that I think about all this, I've probably done a lot more suppressing than repressing. You will probably agree. How true you are with this matter. I really do want to be punished, yet I also don't want to be. I want to live, yet I want to die. Sometimes I feel guilty for what I've done, other times I feel good about it and I want to live longer so that I can gloat over my sins. Now I will tell you something about the other shootings with the exception of the first one, which I covered at length in an earlier letter. The second job was the Denaro Keenan one. Both of them sitting in a red Volkswagen and making out. This was my second murder attempt with my 44. I had approached from the rear of the car, walked up to the passenger side window and opened fire. I was more frightened than they were. Only one bullet struck the young man and he really wasn't the intended target. I had fired with one hand and wildly, boy did I mess up, but really I was very nervous. 
After the shooting, I ran to my car and I drove off quietly to a white castle on Northern Boulevard. There isn't much more to say that hasn't already been said in court transcripts and during my talks with the doctors and during my confession at the time of my capture. The third shooting was the Lomino de Masi incident. This happened in November of 76. I saw the two girls on the porch of one of their homes. I drove my car around the corner, parked carefully, and then went to the location. Again, I was nervous and I fired my gun with one hand. I shot wildly and poorly. However, this time I was able to read the full story in the headlines of the New York Post the following day. Naturally, I was disappointed that for all my trouble and risks, no deaths resulted. The fourth incident was in Forest Hills on January of 1977. This did result in a homicide, to my joy at the time. However, this shooting was different than all of the other for two reasons. One, because I used two hands to fire the gun. Two, because I didn't have any fear. This time, when I crept up to the car and fired, I wasn't frightened, and I remained calm and cautious. After the shooting, I ran to my car and escaped. I escaped the freezing night. The next day, I heard about her death and the police's theory that this recent shooting was connected to several others in the Bronx and Queens. Lastly, I cannot explain my change, a loss of fear, except for the fact that I was growing more cold-blooded daily as my thoughts centered on murder and because of my determination was increasing, my frustrations were building. The fifth incident was also in Forest Hills. Brazingly, I traveled through that same neighborhood only a few weeks after the first shooting there. I spotted a girl walking up the street. She was pretty, slender, and dressed nicely. Without really looking about because my eyes were focused directly on her only, I just pulled out my revolver from a plastic bag and I shot her once in the face. I had no fear with the exception of being caught and I was so transfixed on the shooting and my victims that I didn't notice my large plastic bag falling on the floor. I just left it there. I really didn't care. After the shooting, I drove straight home and I watched the news on the 11 o'clock news. The next day, I purchased a daily news post and times. I remember the headline, Second Killing Stuns Forest Hills, Daily News. The sixth incident was in the Bronx, a double murder of a young couple on the service road of the Hutchinson River Parkway. It was my best job because it resulted in two deaths. Plus, I left my first carefully concocted note on the scene. My shooting pattern improved greatly due to my fearlessness, which slowly developed, and my two-handed shooting method. Four shots were fired. Three hit the victims out of four fired. The man was hit twice in the head, the girl once in the face. How I was making the papers nearly every day. The chase was on and the public was watching out for me. The seventh shooting was in Bayside, Queens. Two were wounded and I was angry. I don't see how that girl lived. Again, I had no fear. I was alert and cautious. I run to the car only to quickly escape and I cunningly traveled up 35th Street and not on the main road, Northern Boulevard. This shooting was close to my sister's house. The final incident happened in Southern Brooklyn. I shot to death Stacy Moskowitz. The routine was the same. However, this time I consciously set myself up. You know the end result. I was captured. There isn't anything more to add. My goal in all these murders and attempted murders was only to kill my victims as quickly and as painlessly as possible. I didn't want to wound them. Aiming for the head was the surest way. Dr. Abramson, I hope this is what you wanted. 
If you have any, and any more questions, just ask. Lastly, I've enclosed a clipping from the Inquirer on the psychology of horror movies. Hopefully, this won't happen to me. I mean, what happened to Ronald Defoe? I just pray that they don't make some silly movie out of this. Wishing you well. P.S. I've also enclosed some legal papers which show you that I've literally sealed my fate and I've made an, an appeal impossible. You may keep these papers. Yours truly, David Berkowitz. Wow, so that was a tough letter. Regardless of where you are with your beliefs on this case, I think that David clearly explains the progression from an uncertain, unskilled murderer to someone more cunning and confident and less emotionally attached towards the end. Now, if you read the documents in the People versus Berkowitz under the arrest reports, you're going to see that a lot of his, a lot of his testimony it matches. So, you know, I'm not telling you what to believe. You believe whatever you want to believe, but that was an emotional letter. So I'm going to cut that one here. And next time I pick up on another letter and I'm near the computer, I might just jump on again and share it with you. I hope that you're enjoying these short videos and I certainly appreciate you being here with me. Thank you so much for the support. Have an awesome day.